9. Monster of the East River The Montauk Monster was an animal corpse that washed ashore on a beach near the business district of Montauk, New York, in July 2008. The identity of the animal and the reliability of stories surrounding it have been the subject of dispute and conjecture. Experts ultimately decided the carcass belonged to a waterlogged raccoon. The story was launched on July 23, 2008, with an article in the newspaper called The F-22 Raptor. Jenna Howitt, 26, of Montauk, and three of her friends said that they saw the creature on July 12th at the Ditch Plains Beach. Hewitt said she and her friends were looking around for a place to sit when they noticed some people staring at something on the beach. They didn't know what it was. Somebody joked that it was something from Plum Island. Plum Island Animal Disease Center, PIADC, is a United States federal research facility dedicated to the study of foreign animal diseases. Paleontologist Darren Nye studied the photograph and determined from the corpse's teeth, skull shape, and front paws that the creature was a raccoon. The reason for its strange appearance was simply a consequence of decay and being in the water. This resulted in eliminating most of the animal's hair and some of its flesh. Nye disagreed with the idea that the legs were excessively long for a raccoon. He showed a raccoon's body superimposed over the corpse in the photograph. In a Fox News interview, Jeff Corwin also identified the carcass as that of a raccoon. Whatever the Montauk monster might be, the folks who found it managed to take a picture, ensuring its image spread across the globe. 8. Bristol Freighter Not a lot seems to be known about this Bristol Freighter plane, which came back down to Earth in Canada in 1956. It's incredible that no fatalities came out of this dramatic situation, where it reportedly shattered the ice on impact. Whatever happened, it's been immortalized in a photo showing the plane poking its nose out of the trees. The Bristol Freighter, or Bristol 170, was a former World War II plane turned post-war commercial flyer. It took to the skies in 1945. One notable feature about it was the way you entered the vehicle. Also known as an air ferry, the 170-170 would accommodate cars through doors in the nose. After landing on the Beaver Lodge Lake, the crew started to break when the left main gear went through the ice, causing the left wing to strike the ice and bend. The three crew members were rescued, but the aircraft was abandoned because it was considered too damaged to be repaired. The aircraft wound up in some sticky situations over the years, but this particular scenario looks pretty hairy. It was pulled up on shore and stripped for parts before being abandoned. What is a diving bell spider? or Argyronita aquatica. Argyronita is the genus name, derived from argyros, the Greek word for silver, plus nita for something that's spun. This is the key to the idea of the spider's diving bell. It makes its own protective bubble out of silk and places it underwater, creating a kind of a hangout for creepy crawlies. We didn't know a spider could exist below the surface of a river, but turns out it most definitely can. The diving bell spider spends a lot of time underwater like a fish. It can spend as long as a day down there, as a study dated 2011 showed. How does it breathe? Oxygen is present inside the bubble, but it also takes in oxygen from the surrounding water. This doesn't last forever though, and the bubble shrinks over time until the spider needs to go up top and bag more oxygen. The diving bell spider builds its home in vegetation and even deposits its eggs inside the bubble. Researchers were surprised to find that the spiders could stay underwater for more than a day. It was previously believed that they had to come to the surface as often as every 20 to 40 minutes during the day. It's valuable for the spiders to stay still for so long without having to surface to refurbish the bubble. This not only protects them from predators, but also means they don't scare off any potential prey that comes around. Quite an industrious little creature, though we're sorry to report that their numbers are dwindling. 6. Bizarre Bugs and Creepy Crawlies Long worms with teeth known as derados and concrete-eating bugs called gribbles have been known to float around in the depths of the Hudson River. Despite being nearly microscopic, the gribbles cause problems by munching through tough stuff like concrete and wood. They cause significant problems and there's not much the authorities can do about it besides trying to repel them. It seems creepy crawlies are causing the real headaches in the city that never sleeps. They can potentially cause damage to underwater structures made of concrete and wood, but there may be a happy ending to this crazy story. The gribble is being looked at as a source of environmental stability. Scientists analyze the enzymes inside the gribble that break down the concrete and wood. Seems, 
the enzyme could prove very useful in the making of biofuel, for which an epic amount of material would need to be reduced to a liquid. The ultimate goal is to duplicate the effect of this enzyme on a manufacturing scale. Rather than trying to get these cellulose from the gribble, the team has transmitted the genetic blueprint of this enzyme to an industrial microbe that can produce it in enormous amounts. This would be done the same way that they make enzymes for biological washing detergents. They hope by doing this, they can reduce the costs of turning woody materials into biofuels. 5. Giant Tooth In 2019, a 12-year-old boy was visiting family in Millersville, Ohio, when he spotted a strange object in a creek. Fishing it out, he came to realize that he had stumbled upon a tooth, and an ancient one of that. Inquiries about the tooth were sent to professors from Ohio State University, Ashland University, and the College of Worcester. They verified from pictures that it was a mammoth tooth. Mammoths are thought to have died out a few thousand years ago, so who knows how long that thing was in the creek. Mammoths replaced their teeth as they aged. The old ones fell out and miraculously survived till the 21st century. According to experts, you're far more likely to see a tooth than a skeleton because of the number of times the teeth were displaced. Jason Neese said that one of his cousin's sons, Jackson, found the fossil while playing in the creek near the Inn Nile Zones. Neese said he'll bring the tooth to Jackson when he visits him later this week so he can show it off at school. He hopes Jackson will bring it back later so he can display it at the inn. Where do you think the tooth belongs? Let us know in the comments and remember to hit that subscribe button. 4. Hadrian's Head The Roman Empire was truly epic and stretched as far as London, England. Before it became the teeming hub we know today, the Romans called the area Londinium, and it was their center of operations during the famous occupation of Britain. Emperor Hadrian was one of the empire's rulers, overseeing worldwide territories between 117 and 138 AD, and it stands to reason that tributes would be made of him to honor his greatness. Bronze statues were produced of Hadrian to preserve his image for eternity, this head rendering of the emperor was found in the Thames River. As for the body, that was long gone after the head was decapitated. The statue may have been put up to commemorate Hadrian's visit to Britain in AD 122. Hadrian traveled broadly throughout the empire, and regal visits generally inspired programs of rebuilding and beautification of cities to welcome him. There are many marble statues of him, but this one made in bronze is a rare find. Considering it's been in a river, the find is surprisingly in good condition. There are some cracks and parts missing, notably the eyes, which were typically created from glass. This rare example of a bronze portrait is currently at the British Museum. It's believed to depict Emperor Hadrian at approximately the age of 30. Hadrian made a lasting impact on the nation. For example, his legendary landmark Hadrian's Wall stretches from the northeast of England up to the border of Scotland and covers the entire width of that section of the country. The emperor would later die from congestive heart failure. 3. Shipwreck Stack We usually associate shipwrecks with tropical oceans, but it's easy to overlook examples that are found in locations such as the Hudson River, New York. Sonar analysis revealed two wrecks in a rather intriguing position. One was sitting on top of the other. Researchers believe the bottom ship is from the 19th century and was a sailing craft of some kind. The other is a more recent type of boat, a cabin cruiser. How on earth did this crazy stack happen? Could it be that the crew sank and just so happened to land on top of the other boat? Identified in the area of Yonkers City, Westchester County, the find was reported in 2009. As with any shipwreck, the possibility exists that scavengers or anyone who fancies a peak will venture down and potentially run into some problems. Because this is a heavily populated area, the chances of underwater intruders are a major concern for officials. Their archaeological sites, says William Ryan, a senior scientist, and the state which funds his research has concerns about amateur treasure hunters who can't handle the currents. With that in mind, authorities keep the exact locations of such spectacular underwater sites under wraps. 2. Radioactive River The last thing you expect to find in a river is radioactive material especially when that river features a national monument. A section of the mighty Canadian Columbia River, called Hanford Reach, became polluted with waste following the shutdown of the Hanford Nuclear Production Complex in Washington, USA, during the late 20th century. Covering 586 square miles, the site had been operating since 1943 
and originally started up through the infamous Manhattan Project. It holds a key role in nuclear history, though that honor is rather dubious. Fueled by tensions during the Cold War, it grew in scale, but safety concerns took a back seat. Not only was the Columbia River polluted by what went on there, but also the air was contaminated. It wasn't until the late 1980s that authorities began really pulling together for an epic cleanup job, though this was far from a perfect solution. Reports from 2017 revealed that radioactive waste from groundwater was still entering the Hanford Reach. A large amount of the waste had been sealed off from the environment, however, and not everything had been addressed. There was also talk of funding cuts that had the potential to put the cleanup at greater risk. How much radioactive waste is still at the site? In total, it's believed that as much as 500 million gallons, 227,304,500 liters of arguably hazardous material is at the old site. The nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain was earmarked as a final destination for some of the waste, though that got tied up in legal knots still going on to date. As recently as 2021, a leak was reported from the Hanford site. It's incredible, over three quarters of a century on from the foundation of the Hanford complex, the government is still dealing with the dangerous contents produced at the plant. There's a new cleanup plan in place, but the EPA and the Department of Energy said the plan would mean cutting $120 million in funding at the Hanford site. The plan worried officials, who said they're already having trouble keeping up with cleanup under the current budget. We don't have enough funding as it is to do the work that needs to be done, said Randy Bradbury, spokesman for the Washington State Department of Ecology's Hanford Nuclear Waste Program. So, the cuts are very concerning. 1. Electric Fish The idea of an electric eel is long embedded in our consciousness. It first came to light in 1766 and was described by Carl Linnaeus, a naturalist from Sweden. Its official categorization is classified as a knife fish. The Amazon and its tributaries contain over 3,000 species of freshwater fish, about three times more than in all of North America. Fish living in hard-to-reach areas like the Javari River are rarely studied and some may be completely unknown. Reports came through in 2019 of a discovery that turned the world of electric eels on its head. A super high-voltage eel was uncovered in the Amazon rainforest. Its electrical capacity was so dramatic that it led to scientists dividing the electric eel into separate species for the first time. Previously, they were referred to as Electrophorus electricus. They are now joined by Electrophorus, Volti, and Vari. Volti is the one you might want to focus on because of its eye-popping shock value of 650 volts. This places it a couple of hundred volts ahead of the competition, it seems. And thankfully, it's over a whopping 8 feet 2.5 meters in length, meaning you can't miss if it happens to be swimming towards you. What happens if you get shocked by Electrophorus Volti? Well, it wouldn't be good news, but it wouldn't be all bad, at least relatively speaking. 650 volts is five times more powerful than the socket at home. The overall effect is reportedly tempered by the number of amps involved. Amps are the measurement of an electrical current strength. You'll get a shock, but you probably won't die from the jolt. Luckily, recent developments mean that experts don't need to get up close and personal with an eel to see if it's in the water or not. An emerging system called MyFish enables scientists to see what's been in a body of water simply by analyzing DNA traces left behind there. They can do the research quickly, inexpensively, and without a life-threatening electric shock. A recent expedition on the Javari River was the first in a series for researchers trying to bridge the gap between outdated biological surveys and new, faster genetic methods. Fast-tracking biodiversity screening in remote regions like the Javari is the only way for us to understand what it would mean to lose these amazing creatures. Thanks for watching. Which of these amazing finds would you like to see firsthand? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon. Bye.